Bye. Hello, welcome. Hello. I think I think we are live on YouTube. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Oh, there's how many of you? Sixty people watching. Amazing. This is wow. This is a big so great. Welcome, everyone uh, watching us uh, at home or in uh, the train, wherever you are. We are tonight, we have our first um, live stream, our first Easy Languages live stream with partners from all over the world, almost. So let's start introducing ourselves. Maybe, Elaine, would you like to start? Yes, sure. So I am Elaine and uh, I am part of the Easy French team. Bonjour. <laughs> Manuel. And, uh, yeah. Sure, my name is Manuel, and uh, just like Kari, I'm part of Easy German, and I'm in Berlin right now. Rita, from where are you streaming for us? I'm Saint Germain en Laye, not far from Paris, and I'm part of the Easy French team with Hélène and Judith. Voilà. Bonsoir, les amis. <laughs> Hi, Dimitris. Hi, yes, it is a little bit like Eurovision. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Dimitris. Uh, I'm uh, part of the Easy Greek team. I'm uh, streaming live from you or you from Athens. And I hope uh, we have um, a little fun tonight and we will share some interesting tips for you. And last but not least, hello, Azarin. Hello, hello. So my name is Azarin. I'm part of Easy Gujarati. I'm, from, I'm in Canada. Cal in Calgary specifically, so really close to the Rocky Mountains. Ezrin is also known from Easy English previously and is yes. now here with a brand new language. When is your first video coming out? Actually, I'll be sending it. Uh, I need to watch it one more time today to make sure that there's no typos or anything, but assuming it all looks good, I'll be sending it today to, um, to Justina. So. Amazing. So another new language on Easy Languages. I'm Kari. I'm from the Easy German team. And together with Elaine, I'll be hosting today's live call. And the topic of today's live call is our personal tips. Most of us uh, started to work with Easy Languages because we are learning languages ourselves. And actually, everyone who became part of Easy Languages somehow shared the same passion and then watched some other video and then started to become part of Easy Languages, him or herself. So we obviously have a lot of experience with language learning and uh, today we want to talk a little bit about our tips to learn a language. Um, but first, before we go to the tips, Elaine will start with a quick warm up to get to know each other better. So we get to know each other better and then also the audience will get to know us a little better. Yes, thank you, Carrie. So I have a special game for you, which is a guess who game, but special for language learning. So in this little bag, uh, we have little facts, funny or interesting facts about each of our hosts. And I'm going to pick them up randomly and you will try to guess who that is between all of us. And of course, we invite you to write uh, your answer in the comments in the in the chat. Shall we start? Let's go. Let's, Let's go. go. Okay. So, so are we first, also allowed to share our thoughts? Um, I think this is better to let uh, the people try on the chat. Maybe we can help. Okay. So the first one. Who, between the six of us, is a certified English teacher for adults? 
Hmm. What do you think? Hmm. <laughs> Maybe more than one. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's start. Uh, I'm I'm checking the comments and see if we have someone who knows. Who of us is a certified teacher? Is it Dimitris? Uh, or is it oh someone writes Elaine, you are my favorite. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dimitris, Ezran, Rita, Dimitris, Kari, Dimitris. Are, uh, actually guessing correctly. Okay. This is one of the points I sent in. So one of my uh, language learning facts is yes, I'm a uh, certified English teacher for adults. Sorry, my cat is on my desk. Sorry. Hello. He's making a mess. <laughs> Hello. <What> Hello. <laughs> yes, he's uh, he's quite uh, talkative, yeah. uh, like. Yeah, so it is Dimitris who's a certified English teacher. Next one. Amazing. So let's look at that one. Who among the six of us just graduated in foreign languages pedagogy this year? Who is it? Well, someone loves our podcast, Manuel. Mm -hmm. mm, so you. we have some people saying Rita, Elaine, Rita, Carl. I don't know who Carl is. Dimitri's <laughs> cat. Rita, Esrin. <laughs> Rita. Mm, Esrin, Rita. I think Elaine. My favorite is Dimitri's cat. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Could be. Okay, most people guess it's Rita. Yeah, but someone actually have uh, the right actually. answer. And this isn't Rita. This is actually me. I think somebody wrote, uh, wrote that as a comment, but I don't catch the name uh, yet. But yeah, oh, uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Rodriguez. Yes, I am. <laughs> it's me. Wow. Congratulations, Benjamin. Yeah. So congratulations next again to Ellen, by the way. Huh? Yes. <laughs> congratulations, Ellen, for your graduation. For foreign languages, I mean, you're the expert here. I am. Yeah. That's why I'm moderating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Shall we continue a little bit? So, who? is currently trying to learn Polish. That's an easy one. Dim, 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 We don't have any guesses. No, Manuel. Manuel is a guess. Ezran is a guess. Kari. Manuel, Kari, 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 Manuel, Kari, Manuel, Kari, Manuel. I'm reading the comments live. <laughs> okay, so no one, two people said Ezran, five people said Manuel, and the rest said Kari because of Janusz, it says uh, Sophie. And it's you guys, <laughs> you guys are right. Uh, it's, it's important to say I'm trying, but I'm not actually <laughs> very active and not very successful. <laughs> That's why I'm I'm more trying. But every you know, maybe every month I learn a new word. That's very slow but constant. Okay, should I maybe like yes. one or two other ones, and then we'll be like moving on. Yes, so, give us yeah. more. Oh, this is a. Is this is also about Polish? A different one. Who? Do you think can say a very difficult Polish tongue twister, which I'm not going to try to pronounce? <laughs> okay, who can say a difficult tongue twister? Hmm. Hmm. In Polish. Esran is writing in the chat that he's curious about this one. <laughs> <laughs> Manuel probably. Yeah, and whoever it is. I I want to hear them say it. <laughs> okay, my guess is also Manuel. I'm participating in the chat. <laughs> Rita, what Manuel? about what about Dimi, What about Dimitri's cat? <laughs> yes. 
I'm not actively learning uh, Polish anymore. I forgot almost all of my Polish, but I still remember the good old So, can you <laughs> say this again? One word. thing I remembered. Wow. <laughs> Now I would mm -hmm. like to hear from some Polish people if this was correct. This, and this needs to be in someone confirm. My, uh, Easy Polish. Easy Polish is writing. Love it, Manuel. Three exclamation points. Thanks. And Christine. a happy I smiley. Congratulations. And Nicola writes, Wow, I'm from Poland. It was perfect. Amazing, Manuel. You got a lot of new Polish fans tonight. Can we have one last one, um, Elaine? Yeah, this is going to be the last one. So, people, who do you think can say that he or she has at least three mother tongues? <sighs> okay, who has at least three mother tongues? I think I know. I know. <laughs> well, we are looking at and I'll probably get that one. The there might be more than uh, Rita, more. Rita, Kari, Esrin, Manuel, Esrin. Everyone. <laughs> Rita. Mm -hmm. Dimitris, Esrin, Dimitris, Esrin, Dimitris. Oh, this is very split. Rita, Esrin, Rita, Dimitris, Esrin, maybe Janusz, but he's not here. Rita, obviously. Rita, trick question. Wow. Okay, now we need to solve this. Yeah. It is. Who can I solve it? Um, I suppose I know about the others, but <laughs> I thought I thought you had more than three mother tongues. Yes, I do, but I said at least. <laughs> I think Ellen said at least because it depends on the definition. We had a very interesting talk with some other people on women in language and. It's complicated to define your mother tongue or a native language. So that's why we said at least three. So, <laughs> and okay, which are those? I'm speechless. So, Amazir, uh, which is Berber, uh, Arabic, French, and there is also Portuguese and English that could be like counted. So, yeah. But the three that I use more often with family are the, the first I, I said. All right. And now everyone wants to know, of course, how could you grow up in all these languages? Can you tell us more about the influence? With whom did you speak them or where did you live to speak them? So uh, my family, like the background, uh, my parents spoke already many languages because of their family background or because where they lived. And we lived all over. And with my parents, I spoke, I mean, at home, in our household, we spoke four languages every day. So, and my, like, it was easy for us to uh, switch between languages even when they were not close. So it's kind of difficult to say how it was for me because I was in it. So it was just replying to my mother in English, especially when she was angry. Sorry, mom, if you're watching this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was uh, Amazir, especially my father was trying not to talk Amazir to us. Maybe he was hiding, speaking to his family, his language. So we won't understand French because it's also my language. Portuguese because of Brazil and um, yeah, and Spanish in Morocco. Also there is Spanish. So it was all always many languages at the same time. The only thing that was very difficult when I was young is that I had to think and use only one language in one sentence, which was very difficult because other kids wouldn't understand what I would say. I would use some words from Arabic or, you know, Portuguese or English or whatever else. And they will be like, what are you talking about? So. Not even showing you. <laughs> For me, it wasn't. For me, it was just natural. And growing up, I understood that some people um, would think that I would make it on purpose or it was a show off. But, you know, when we meet people like you or people like that are passionate uh, about language, we realize that this is just natural. You have to find your, you know, your, your crowd and your people and it becomes normal. That's very impressive, Rita. And also probably very cool to grow up in so many languages and you could always hide and have some secrets with some people that other people couldn't understand. 
I mean, you know, Mikari, I don't have secrets. I talk a lot, so. (laughs) 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 I didn't use that. Uh, (laughs) So nice. Cool. So let's come to our next section or our main section for tonight. And these are basically our language learning tips. So we have assembled like four topics, four topics that we would like to discuss. And then for each of the topics, we have uh, some of us sharing their tips. And we'll start with the topic of setting goals. Elin, could you uh, explain why setting goals is very important when learning a language? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, we talked about that as our first tip because uh, obviously when you try to learn a language, it's uh, very helpful to know which level you want to reach in that language and especially for what purpose do you want to learn that language. And, yeah, setting these goals can really help you, like, to, you know, to pave your way, to know what to do, when to do it. And, uh, yeah, so maybe... You can share a little bit with us what language do you learn and uh, why? What is your goal in that language? Yeah, that's interesting. Maybe um, we can have a quick summary or some answers from our audience. Uh, I assume that we have lots of different language learners here in the audience. Some people maybe learn French, some Greek, some German, some Polish. Um, Please share with us what is your goal for learning a language for example is your goal to study in poland to move to germany do you have uh, a french husband a french wife Uh, we are excited to hear some of your motivations and goals i learned french to study in montreal that's a that's a good goal i have challenges listening to different regional accents Mm -hmm. Someone wants to study and move to Germany. I'm just here for exciting storylines, writes <laughs> Jerry. And Annie Mita um, is learning German just because she likes the language. That's oh, also nice. I think nice. a lot of people. Who of you has? Who of you here has learned a language just out of liking it and not because you actually needed it? Is there anyone here? Ezrin, or Dimitri, or everyone but me. <laughs> Wait, that's nice. Ezrin, what did you learn? Well, I mean, I guess probably every language I speak, for, basically. Just out of <laughs> curiosity. Um, yeah, so like, so I suppose Spanish. I started learning Spanish just because I wanted to. It was offered in my high school, and then I liked it um and then mandarin as well it is something i just decided to to start learning about five or six years ago so that's another one <clears throat> those are probably the two that as like an adult that i chose i was like okay i want to go learn these um even actually gujarati is a good example too because i grew up with it but then i actively studied it too because i couldn't read and write before i didn't you know i didn't really know how the grammar worked a lot of words i didn't know so then i had to actively go study it but I like the comment so, from Fankuchen who yeah. wrote, I learned a bit of Swedish to show off at IKEA. I, I wonder how this uh, worked because I assume you have to go to Sweden to actually show off with Swedish at IKEA. <laughs> you can order at the restaurant nice. and use the correct pronunciation for the shit. Really. Or read nice. the funny names of those, uh, everything that they're selling. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Dimitris, you had... Um, a tip for us when setting goals, like what is your one tip about setting goals when learning a language? Uh, first of all, I want to say that um, setting goals is not just uh, certificates. And sometimes we think that getting a certificate will get us to a point in the language where we would be perfect while speaking it, um, we can't be perfect in anything. Even native speakers cannot be perfect, right? So we have perfection or a vague concept, like being good in a language is not a goal. It has to be specific, of course. But it's not just that. It's um, 
for me, a goal has to be, um, you, you need to have specific goals for different time periods, like have a short-term goal, a mid-term goal, and a long-term goal. Where do you imagine yourself with the language one week from now, one month from now, one year from now, or even 10 years from now? This could give you some idea about um, what your real goal is in the language, whether you want it, whether you just like it, or whether you uh, want it for work, or, or whether you want it to live in the country at some point. This should give you um, a guideline, I think. Mm -hmm. Esarin, you also had some remarks on setting goals when learning a language. Yes, indeed I do. So I think a lot of people I meet, a lot of language learners I meet, um, often they're afraid to set goals, like they don't want to set goals for one of two reasons. Either one, they think they're going to set a goal and then it's they're going to fail or they're not going to hit it. And so they're scared that, oh, maybe I shouldn't set one because what happens if I don't get there? And in my perspective, I think that's a little bit silly. Not silly, that's the wrong word. I, I think it's important to understand that um, when it comes to when it comes to setting a goal, I think the most important thing is that you aimed at something because even if you failed, you you still made you you still made progress because you aimed at something. Versus if you didn't aim at something, you probably wouldn't have progressed as much. And the second reason I see very commonly that people don't necessarily want to set goals is they feel that it ties them down. It ties them down in the sense that now they have to work towards something specific. They have to follow a specific schedule maybe and they feel kind of restricted and you know I think it's tough because it, it can be a little bit restrictive for sure but at the same time I think having some focus and having some some focus of where you're going can definitely make it a bit of a faster process so that's my perspective that's interesting to hear like so out of all of us sitting here who of you has successfully learned with a goal or who has set a goal and then met the goal? Only Rita, mm. oh, but you too, Esther. Yeah, nice. That's, a, that's some good idea. So our first tip is basically set yourself some goals also for you to have a strong motivation to reach that goal. And as Esther said, don't be afraid to set the goal and don't be afraid to fail because it's in the end it's always better to have a goal and even if you fail you have tried it it's better than having no goal and maybe at some point um, lose your motivation our next tip is sorry did someone say something our next tip is um, finding the right resources that's actually a very good topic i mean we create resources ourselves all the time. Elin, how difficult or easy is it to find the right resources? So I, I find it always very difficult because if you study a very uh, common language, you will find tons of resources and sometimes you can get a little bit lost. And if you study like more of a rare language, you are going to struggle to actually find something. So it is not very easy. So I think what is really important is to be specific. You want to learn that language, but what exactly do you want to learn in that language? Do you want to learn like the basic phrases or do you want to learn some specific type of vocabulary? So for example, if you're using YouTube, I would really recommend to be specific in your uh, YouTube research. Like for example, if you want to study in France, you can look for a uh, French uh, studies vocabulary. If you want to travel somewhere, you can like, write down travel to Germany, uh, travel vocabulary for German beginners. Always try to be as specific as you can. I think this is helpful. Dimitris, you um, wanted to talk about learning resources that could be like a trap where you think it's like a good idea, but then it turns out to be not so useful. I have uh, one specific or a couple of specific examples uh, in mind. One of them was trying to read uh, the Unendliche Geschichte in German. And <laughs> this uh, got me uh, nowhere, really, because um, after a point, I realized 
I wasn't really interested in learning the vocabulary that was in the book, right? In the in theory, uh, a children's book is uh, an ideal um, is ideal content for a reader. But uh, as long as you're not really interested in what is there for you, then uh, I guess it won't work. At least it didn't work for me. Um, same goes for, um, for example, video games. I thought by playing video games in my target language would be, for example, uh, Spanish and German, that I would get something from it. But it, it really worked for me when I was uh, a teen or a child and I, I was uh, interested in the content of the video games. But um, as an adult, I, it, the, the motivation isn't there. Uh, in contrast, I wanted to say that um, things like podcasts, for example, the Easy German podcast, uh, is uh, really <laughs> is uh, really good for the kind of learning I, I I want for myself, because for for my goals at least, because it's um, it's very communicative language you use, like for um, talking about everyday things. Talking about your life, talking about the world in general, uh, it's uh, it's useful. These are things I will really need uh, when uh, whenever I want to speak German or whenever I go to Germany or whenever I I want to think in German. So for me, the things like children's books and things like that just be more focused on what you really want to use the language. Thank you, Dimitris, for this wonderful shout out. Super nice. But I, I absolutely agree on you saying that you need to find something that really excites you personally. And I would, in my target language, I would also want to uh, find resources that are similar to the resources that I like in my personal life. For example, if I like comedy, I like to find comedy in the language. And if I like to you know, learn or read about politics. I would like to find some resources where I can read about politics in this target language. And obviously there, it's sometimes difficult to, you know, start with the right level, but I absolutely share this experience with you that children books are usually not exciting for me because they are targeted at children. Rita, you also had some interesting tip to share or some experience. Yes, it is something very uh, common, actually, I realized myself. Um, a lot of people are not uh, English native speakers. Uh, and when they want to find some resources, let's say maybe for minority languages, you know, learning, or even more common languages, it's kind of difficult. They find it in English, especially if they live abroad. So what I wanted to talk about is laddering. It's called laddering. It's like learning a new language, like your target language, using a base language that isn't your mother tongue. And that's, for me personally, very fun because when I was buying some books, for example, let's say I was starting to learn Swedish and Norwegian, all the Scandinavian languages, and I bought the book when I was in Germany. And I said, wow, that's awesome. It's been so long, I didn't speak any German and I could understand it quite well and everything, why not just learn those languages that are part of the same family um, in, in German? And I started doing that and I realized this is so so much fun. And I started doing some research and I realized a lot of people do that. It might be a little problematic. You have to absolutely feel comfortable with that first language. And then you realize that the challenge is amazing because it helps you um, maybe refresh your vocabulary in that first language you, you learned already and also find maybe resources that could be more fun that you don't find in your own language. And sometimes it also makes more sense. Let's say you're learning Spanish and you already mastered or you feel comfortable with Italian. And then you're like, okay, they're part of Romance languages. They are similar. Why not? But then you're like, mm, people told me they're similar. It might be confusing. But actually, if you really kind of map the road because it's a journey right and you realize okay i was on the road trip in you know italy i loved it and I can just keep on cross france stop by the way and i learned french <laughs> and keep on to spain you know and and why not and then i realized i could find some resources that are more fun and, and that's important because you said it yourself you need to have fun to enjoy the journey to make it your own and another thing some concepts in similar languages are easier to explain than in your own, which makes you really try to think in that new language instead of coming back to your own scheme, you know, of the language you know since you're young. 
So it's something that I find very interesting if you, at least at a B1, B2 level, try learning a language, you know, uh, a target language in another language you learned already to be able to keep up with both. Voila. Merci. That sounds like an exciting challenge, Rita. It's called laddering, right? Like a ladder climbing up the ladder. That's super nice. By the way, for those people of you who are leaving comments, if you have general questions or questions for specific people, we will have in the end a Q&A session where you can ask questions. So feel free to, to wait with general questions um, until the end. So our third tip or our third topic that we collected tips for is setting a learning schedule. Elaine, why is it important to set a schedule for learning a language? So, yeah, this is really important because like all what we do is habits, right? We only have habits. So learning that language should be part of the daily, daily habits, daily routine. And once you have set that in your mind, that you are going to do this like 15 minutes of French a day, it's going to be very easy to actually do it. And also, I think this is very important, just like for the goals, to be as realistic as possible. It's much better to set up like 15 minutes, even 10 minutes if you are very busy. You can just say, I'm going to do 10 minutes of French in a day. And then you are going to realize that you are actually able to do it, that 10 minutes are not so much, and maybe you can even do more. And you will feel really satisfied if you can actually do more than what you have planned. 10 minutes a day, is that enough? Manuel, what is your experience with setting a schedule? Yeah, so my tip is actually just an extension of what Elaine just said, or it's almost the same thing. Um, for me, it's all about routine and setting extremely realistic targets or goals. So when I was studying Spanish, for example, I set a goal of 20 minutes of studying per day. And those 20 minutes are non-negotiable. They happen whatever the day brings um, at the time I was traveling. So even if I was on a bus all day or even if I was sick, those 20 minutes would always happen and I would have different resources so like um dimitris uh, mentioned podcasts earlier if i was just literally traveling all day i would just use a podcast or i would use an app and if i was at home i would use my book and those 20 minutes would always always happen there's no dis decision involved they just happen every day and then what i would find is that very often i would just be in the flow and i would just keep going and then from you know it, it would turn into 40 minutes or an hour or two hours And I think it's much better to approach it that way than to set like every Sunday, I'm going to sit down for two hours or three hours. And I think it's a very common tip, like every language learning book shares this tip. Like it's not a, <laughs> it's not a brand new tip, but I really think it's like so important to just have a tiny target every day and do it no matter what. Um, it's so much more effective than saying like, oh, okay, Saturday is my study day. That sounds like you successfully learned a language. <laughs> <laughs> Still learning. Nice. Nice. Uh, Ezrin, you also have some experience with um, setting a schedule for yourself. Yeah. First, I just want, I want to build on what Manuel said. It's a like very good point. Like, I think it has to be consistent, which comes down to discipline, which is really difficult. So everyone, you have to work on your discipline in order to be able to in order to be able to even hold yourself to 20 minutes a day or whatever the number is so it's really difficult and it takes time and practice to get there um i think building on the whole routine theme that we have the other day someone mentioned something they use for working out which i think works really well for languages too or could work really well a friend of mine was telling me that what he does to exercise every day is throughout his house he has little papers stuck on all sorts of different places. So before he opens the fridge, he has to do 20 squats. So he looks at it and like, that's the cost of opening the fridge. Before he can turn the TV that's on, he has amazing. to do like, I think it's 10 pushups. So that's the cost of turning the TV on. There's, and he's all throughout his house. He has different stickies. And I was like, that's so smart. And this was just two days ago. And I was like, and 
I was thinking, you know, that could work for languages too. Before you open your fridge, you've got to run through your conjugations. You've got to do present tense, two verbs in French, then you can open your fridge. Before you can, and I was like, <laughs> and that's such a... <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think it's a good idea. I think I think it really, I'm actually probably gonna do it myself, to be honest. <laughs> so yeah. Nice. That's, that sounds then, like... Then we go into sorry to interrupt you Kari, but uh, then we go into the topic of um, of discipline what happens when you can't uh, bring yourself to actually uh, do the squats the language squats how, how this is our next uh, actually our next tip i realize but um it's something to it's, I about. think it's related to goals because sometimes we think goals and ambitions are the same thing. It's one thing to, to say, I'd like to be fluent in, let's say, French, German or whatever. That's great. You have to have dreams and goals, uh, ambitions, <laughs> sorry. Goals are little things. You, you shouldn't be saying, oh, I want to learn it in two months or one month. I want to be as, also compare yourself. I want to be as fluent as my neighbor. No. You have to enjoy it. So maybe if you're not able to do it, it's not just because you're not motivated. It's because it's hard for you. So you maybe start, you know, lower your the goal. Do something more smaller. Make sure that you feel comf confident, more comfortable, and then you're gonna be like, whoa, I made it. So why not add up to this? Make it till you so make maybe it. that's a problem. Kinda. <laughs> <laughs> but I think our next and last point also perfectly fits with this topic of discipline. Because our last point is staying motivated. And ultimately, you need to, I mean, as long as you're motivated, it's kind of easy to bring up the discipline and have the discipline to continue to do things. But as soon as you're kind of like busy with something else and something else occupies your day mainly, then you kind of also lose your discipline, you use, lose your motivation. It's kind of connected. Ellen, what do you do to, to stay motivated when learning a language? So I have a very practical tip. It is to actually, that, that might seem a little bit surprising, but I find it useful to actually spend money, like just a little bit. A little bit is enough. But for example, if you, like, if you, if you just buy a notebook to write your new vocabulary in your target language, this can actually really motivate you because you know you have you have bought that thing, right? So you want to use it, and this this works. Like for example, if you don't if you don't want to spend much money in that, that works. But if you if you have more money and you can also, for example, register for a course or buy books, just to invest something, I think this this can help some people. I guess. <laughs> nice. I mean, one, I mean. <laughs> Manuel, would this work for you if you just spent money on language learning resources? Would you then feel more guilty to use them? I don't know. I, <laughs> I think I would mostly be feel guilty, but not actually start using them. Uh, similar to a gym <laughs> membership, maybe. Um, but I like I like the idea, and I think it 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 will definitely work for some people to just kind of put down the investment, and then you have to use it. Um, for me, um, there's one uh, trick that I learned from a blog that I like. Uh, it's a Spanish uh, learning blog. It's called Nacho Time Spanish. And uh, he actually calls his blog, um, it's, it's, it's to fight intermediate purgat uh, purgatory. And what that means is, w like with any skill, it's really easy to make progress in the beginning. And when you just start a new skill or a new language, you're probably really motivated because you make a lot of progress fast. But then once you're at a certain level, once you are able to communicate your thoughts and understand 80, 90% of what people are saying, then it doesn't feel like you're making progress anymore. And that can be very demotivating. And for me, the um, secret to staying motivated is to um, be very intentional about weeding out your mistakes and, and, making sure you're actually making progress. And one way to do that is um, to basically have a journal for your mistakes. So what I used to do is I used to um, have a pen pal in Spanish to practice Spanish. So every day I would write at least 10 sentences. Um, and then I would 
receive an email back the next day with all the corrections, all the mistakes I've made. And I would put all of the mistakes in my language mistakes journal and I would review this journal every week. And if I noticed, oh, this mistake, I've made it three times, um, like a you know, tense uh, mistakes, uh, you know, some grammatical mistakes that keeps happening, I would be very intentional. Okay, this, like, I'm not going to do this anymore and, and be extra careful to avoid this mistake. And then I would realize, okay, I'm not making this mistake anymore. So actively, like, um, journaling or documenting your mistakes so that you can fix them. And that way you can feel your progress and you stay motivated. So it's a lot there, but that's, uh, that's my tip. That sounds like a lot of discipline, Manuel. Amazing. <laughs> Keeping lovely. track of your mistakes. Kari, yeah. can I say something, add up something to the amazing tip that Manuel just gave? Uh, we do something actually in Easy French with our members uh, in our group, in our Slack group. In the beginning, everybody was like, oh, we are kind of shy. We don't want to talk and whatever. We were like, okay, you don't have to disclose that like in the beginning, but you should be maybe recording yourself and just talk. And maybe in a week, in a month, or you're going to watch it again, and then you're going to realize how much progress you, you made. So for people who can't follow up with the tip writing or doing whatever, because you have to really be motivated, even if it's an amazing tip that he just gave here with the, you know, the mistakes and everything, just record yourself. Do it as a fun thing. Just talk to yourself. Read poetry out loud. I don't know. Do whatever you want. But I'm sure then in three months' time, you will feel more fluent and you know, more confident in that language. That's a, that's a very great tip, Rita, because I think lots of people share this experience of having this feeling of not making progress while you actually do. So you kind of, you don't see yourself in like three months or six months ago and you don't have any material to watch. And obviously sometimes you don't have this feeling that you're making progress and it's that's a great thing. I like this tip. Dimitris, you also have a, a tip to share when staying motivated how do you stay motivated uh first of all uh, i wanted to add to what uh, manuel and rita said um that it's important to actually produce language and um, you can't gauge if you're making progress if like manuel said uh, you you get stuck in uh, intermediate uh, purgatory and like that uh, but you need to produce language to flex your muscles a little bit because if you just consume content but uh, don't create content, well, content, this is <laughs> uh, a new word we use now, right? We, we create content. <laughs> if you write or speak or uh, just uh, produce language, if you don't do that, it's difficult to, to, to know where you're at. and. Um, so it can be even writing, not just speaking, because some people, um, like some people can't look at themselves in the mirror or they can't uh, like uh, practice speaking in front of the mirror. I, I don't think uh, recording themselves would work, but writing or, um, for example, uh, keeping a diary could work, a journal in the, the target language could work. And um, if, if you can have someone uh, correct, what you write, of course, that would be even better. But what I wanted to say, my tip is actually has to do with uh, how we forget and how we remember. I read a very interesting article a few days ago that talked about uh, the science of um, spaced repetition. Now all the um, flashcard websites that exist use this and very successfully, like, um, you know, all these, uh, I, I'm not, like Anki and Quizlet and even Sidlang, uh, memory, uh, memorize all these uh, websites that teach you vocabulary, use this space repetition. And this is based on the science of how people forget. And apparently there is um, a very specific way, like uh, there is a, a graph that made a, a big impression on me and I wanted to share this with you. I'll share my screen with you. Just for a second. Uh, is it possible? That's a new level here of our live stream, sharing okay. a graph. Yes. I'm excited to see this. Okay, 
So, can I do it though? Share, yes. Yes, you can share your screen. So, can you see this? Yes. Okay, so the first line, the memorization, is the, it displays the curve by which you will have forgotten what you learned in a specific amount of days. Like this graph shows uh, like 60 days. You can see the number of days at the bottom of the screen. And it tells you, okay, if you remind yourself to actually uh, to re remember the thing you just learned, this curve flattens. Like it's very fashionable now, or it used to be six months ago, the, word, the term flattening the curve. Maybe we can flatten the curve in our forgetting and uh, learning. I, I wanted to share this with you because sometimes we feel stupid for forgetting when it's not like this at all. It's very natural and normal to forget. Um, and uh, what we learn in our language is replaced by, I don't know, what um, other things we learn during our life uh, and uh, more pressing things, our brain thinks it has uh, better things to learn than, you know, our our goals in language learning, but um, we can take control of this uh, process. So if this happens to you and you forget a lot, there's nothing wrong with you. You can take control of it. It happens to me a lot that I, I, I am more forgetful than I used to be, and uh, it depresses me, but it's not something that, that's happening to me. I'm, I'm influencing it uh, through the things I'm not doing. So by me being mindful, as uh, we mentioned earlier, we can actually control this process. I think I feel this is very motivating in this whole uh, language learning, uh, how we go about learning languages. Okay, we take power it's, back. It's super interesting, Dimitris, because uh, we did once a video about this at Easy Languages, uh, at Easy German, sorry. Uh, and the video is called um, why is vocabulary learning hard and we actually spoke about this forgetting curve and it's yeah you're really right it's like you shouldn't feel stupid about forgetting things it's just a normal process in the brain and then you need to actively work against it i just tried to share this in the chat but i think the link didn't work so i will share this again later under our video so thank you everyone for sharing so many tips that was really um, insightful and really interesting. And now we have maybe five more minutes to answer questions. So those of you who have already written some questions in the chat that we couldn't answer yet, please feel free to share them again and then we'll be excited to answer them. And maybe um, also, Show them here. Have some of you already spotted some questions that you are answering in the chat yourself? Are we all active in the chat while being in the live stream? Yeah, I actually spot some uh, interesting question. I don't remember who asked that question, but it was, uh, is it a good idea to learn more than one language at the same time? And I think this is kind of an interesting question. Super interesting. What are your thoughts? Um, I think this is actually a good idea. Like, as Rita said, actually, it goes as well with this uh, laddering thing. So it can, you, because like, if you learn two languages that are a little bit related, that, that can actually help you. Yeah, it can also confuse you, of course, but I think this, yeah, I think this is more helpful. I, I, well, there I are a lot of... I personally think one thing uh, to add up to what Ellen said is, it's your own journey, guys. So even if we're given here tips, tips that work, but it might work for us, not for you, you have to feel comfortable with what you're doing and have fun. So if you feel like you really would love to learn two languages, for example, ask yourself the same thing we said earlier. What is the goal? Why do I want to learn them? And if you have a real purpose and you can make a schedule and follow up all the tips that has been given and you feel comfortable with it and you don't have to beat up yourself because you don't feel like you're going as fast as you wish or whatever, then it's fine. If you feel like you're more of a person who would like to explore, you know, that language, that culture, 
you know, deeper and go slower, follow that and do it and do it your, your way. The most important is that when you do the things, you're convinced of how to do it and you keep up with it. The consistency, fun are the, the words, the key words here. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, keep in mind our first tip about the goals. There is no such thing as learn three languages. You need to remind yourself what you want, to, what your level you want, to, what your uh, uh, what you want your level to be. So, if you want to learn uh, three languages, the level of uh, just being able to chat informally at the street uh, or uh, say hello or just um, the basic stuff, you can absolutely do that. But learning three languages to top level, like um, and uh, to near fluency, I don't think that's possible. Uh, at the same time, at least, uh, because uh, each uh, language takes you know, thousands of hours of practice. So it's just a matter of time, I think. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, how do you know what kind of vocab you should focus on? Is it hard to know where to start? There are lists uh, on the internet and also um, there are books of lists that are sorted by how often words are used. And it's because uh, it's a really common mistake to be learning um, vocabulary that is kind of useless, or at least you, you probably won't ever use it. And some language learning apps also suffer from that. They teach you words like, I don't know, um, elephant is probably the same in most languages, <laughs> but they teach you words that you probably won't need, at least in the beginning. So I think it's really good to be strategic and to be learning the words that are most commonly used. And one thing, one technique that I use is uh, essentially when I'm already at a basic level, um, whenever I look up a word in a dictionary and I feel like, oh, this word is important, like I'm, I need it now, I needed it now. So I, I looked it up in the dictionary and I use an app, I mark it. And then that goes into my flashcards or into my memory palace or whatever. Like I learned that word because I already came across a situation where I needed it. So basically learn the vocabulary that you feel like you actually need and not just some random list. Nice. Then we have a question. How do you find people to practice speaking your target language? I guess you all have found language learning partners one way or the other. What are your tips? I would say... We, uh, go ahead, then. No, no, go. No, no, go. Okay. Um, there's, lots of, there's lots of apps and websites where you can do it. So things like Hello Talk is an, is an option. Italki has, has a language partner exchange. I think Tandem is another one. There's, there's quite a few apps and websites that, that have this service, I suppose. Now, the, biggest, the bigger problem, I suppose, is not how do you find people, to, how do you find people? It's what do you do once you found them? And that ends up being the bigger thing. Um, and so that could become a whole hour long video as it is, but couple quick things just off the top of my head. So I think it helps if you've just got, if you've set up some some rules that you're going to follow when you're doing your exchange. So maybe it's, you know, for example, one day you do French and the next day you're doing English or however you choose to do that. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of thoughts. Nice, that's a good idea. Oh, what can I do for improving my accent? is what Kent wrote. I mean, this, this First, is a very broad question, but Rita, you have the answer. That, yeah, no, 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 at all. I, nobody here has answers. We are just trying, we are all trying things. The most important, because a lot of people for Easy French write to us, when we made a video about how to sound like a native, like French person, which is like a difficult question to start with, because in France we have so many different accents. Some people didn't take it the right way. They were like, Oh, but do we really need to have a native accent to speak the language? To answer that, and that I have the answer for it, no. We love people's accent. Everybody has an accent. I have one in my own language. Ellen has one. Everybody here. So it's fine. But the most important is that sometimes when we don't know how to pronounce properly those words, we are 
enable, we're not able to recognize them when a native speaker say like they, they pronounce them. So what I would say is that you have to improve a bit your pronunciation, not to be like a native speaker because you are who you are and that shows your journey on learning languages. So it's amazing to keep your accent, but you have to maybe, as I said before, declaim a text, speak out loud to yourself, even if you don't want to speak to other people because you're too shy and you're like, oh, maybe they won't you know, understand, sing. There are so many apps to sing with other people all over the world. You just try to sing and they will tell you, oh, that was great. And that won't motivate you. So that's my tip. Yeah, and our tip actually with Ellen, because we often say that to our students. <laughs> and can I just add to that? I think with um, some people can learn vocabulary and even grammar just through osmosis, like without doing much, just by immersing themselves. If you move to... Uh, the US, you're probably gonna learn English just by being there, kind of. But accents are different. Accents, you really need to be intentional. If you want to change your accent, you need to intentionally practice and get feedback. And I think that's really important. Oh, we have a question for Manuel that has been asked many times before. So uh, finally, Manuel, could you please answer the question, how did you learn Spanish in Mexico? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a funny story because I, I went to Mexico um, 10 years ago to go to university and I spoke no Spanish when I arrived. I had done like a few, like a basic course, but my Spanish was uh, essentially non-existent and I was just thrown into an environment like I had to take classes at university in Spanish. So I was just writing down everything that the teacher put on the blackboard and then <laughs> I would go home and I would translate it. And I was like, oh, that's what they were talking about. Um, and I think, I mean, obviously it's a luxury, but if you can put yourself into an environment where you're forced to learn, otherwise you essentially won't survive, um, that's a good way to learn. So that's what it was like for me. <laughs> Amazing. That's a, that's a great way to learn. That's, that's when I make most progress in Polish is basically when I'm somewhere where people can't speak English. It's, it's just amazing. It's the, It's the most painful, but also the fastest way to learn a language. <laughs> and then how do you deal with to not mix vocabulary that is quite similar? For example, Catalan and French, if you learn languages that are very similar. Rita, you have probably done this before with the uh, 10, 15 languages you learned. There must have been some similar ones. Uh, no, they are. Honestly, first of all, we are human beings. We make mistakes. We we laugh at them. I made many times I use words and, I'm, and then I'm like in the middle of a sentence and people are looking at me like, what are you talking about? So it's fine. You just laugh it off and you're like, okay, it's okay. And it makes actually create stories. You can tell your grand grandchildren if you want to have some <laughs> one day. So, but I think the most important, if you really, it depends on your goal, but if it's something serious like school or whatever, I had to start from nothing also Mandarin. And I went to China just for fun and I realized, oh, I could do my PhD here. And I thought it was going to be in English and it was actually in Mandarin. So imagine I had, I mixed up so many words. Like the, the, the story that I always tell was hilarious. I was in the amphitheater, it was mathematics. So it's fine. He was right. And I, and I understood what it was that he was talking about, but I was like, why did he say there is fish? And my friend next to me was like, no, he's not talking about fish. He's speaking about explanation. And I was like, huh, really? And I was feeling so dumb after a few months of Mandarin, starting my PhD in mathematics in Mandarin and not able to understand that basic thing. But I just realized because I had fun and I laughed it off that I didn't at all forget about it later. And it's like that, you just have to experience things. So you have just not to take yourself seriously, you know, just have fun. And if you feel like it's something that comes back often, that mistake, the same word, you still cannot get it. Maybe you should try to read more, to hear it, to use it as much as possible. Practice, this is the only way, you know, use it, use it, put it everywhere you can. People will look at you weirdly, but keep it up and your brain will get it. That's my tip. That's a great point to not take yourself too seriously because It's like essentially also how children learn. They, they just do mistakes. They just repeat stuff. They just chat and talk. And I mean, they haven't learned to be afraid of, you know, being like maybe feeling stupid about a mistake they did. That's really cool. We have a last question from Walter. Oh, Walter, so nice that you're watching. We have met in Berlin 
And he asks, how can we help and support your project? I love it. That's such a wonderful last question. <laughs> so Manuel, what do you think? Like you are sending a heart back. How can people support a project? I mean, mostly the, the greatest thing for me personally that I've seen is just have, seeing the project grow. So people joining us and becoming partners, essentially everyone here has first been a viewer of Easy Languages and then started to join us and produce videos in their own language. And if you go to our website, easy-languages.org, you would also figure out on how to become a co-producer. If this is an option for you, that's a great way to support the project. But then there are also a few other ways. <laughs> so um, one great way to support all of our projects and Easy Languages in general is to become a member or a patron. So uh, almost all of our languages or all of our languages have a Patreon page. Patreon is a platform where you can support creators, uh, whether they're musicians or bloggers or YouTubers or anything. And um, in return, you get some extras. So in our case, uh, most of the languages on Easy Languages provide uh, exercises for each video, things like that. So if you want to support Easy French, for example, uh, because you like what they do and you want them to do it more regularly and more often, uh, then you can find their Patreon campaign and you can sign up to become a member and it's just like a few dollars per month and then you support the project and you get benefits that no one else gets. So that would be, I think, the main way to support Easy Languages. And I'm sorry, I'm just preaching for my, my church. Ellen makes wonderful exercises, guys. <laughs> like seriously, I mean, the one who tried already knows it. But you can't imagine, it's not just opening a random grammar book. She takes so much time and love and pride in preparing everything. And I mean, I saw some comments from Joanna, from Farid, from Michael, from a lot of people from the group. And we are so happy to see that. So come and join us. You'll have fun with us and learn <laughs> French. Voila. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, it's really due to our members that we are actually able to do this. And we have mostly all of us have turned the, this project from a from a volunteer free time activity into our jobs, and this is also thanks to you guys, which is amazing. Uh, at the end, I would also like to say that we plan to do this more often. So we would like to hear your feedback on this live call. Um, it's the first time that we are actually having a live call with different Easy Languages hosts involved, and we would like to do this again in the future also with different hosts having different teams join. So please leave your feedback. And the next live stream that we plan is on the 7th of November. So that's a Saturday afternoon at 6 p.m. Berlin time again. And we hope you will join us then. Anything else I forgot? If you want to watch more Easy Languages right now, you can continue on the Easy German and the Easy Italian channel with two new fresh videos that are out right now shadow cool. drawing <laughs> thanks so much to cool then. and to kari for preparing this lovely evening yes it was, it was, it, really good. It was yeah. a joy thanks a lot for to francisco who is in the background of all this so he's like the director of the show yes, and he's francisco. staying behind the scenes <laughs> and thanks for everyone who joined and watched us tonight thank you so much bye bye Bye. Thank you. Au revoir. Hello, Davi. And now I just keep waving until we are cut off from Francisco. Francisco. <laughs>